Welcome to Screencasting 101. In this video, I'm going to explain the basics of screencasting. What I mean by this is how to get started, the process, setting up your environment, and what you need to be aware of and consider before starting. What I'm not going to show you in this video is how to use a particular suite of software. There are plenty of tutorials out there already. So who am I? Well, I'm currently a Microsoft C Sharp MVP and a regular speaker at Code Camps and User Groups. I've authored three courses for Pluralsight, and I produce CodePorn, which is a web series covering software development related topics. I give this talk at Code Camps all around Southern California, and based on the feedback, I decided to share it with the rest of the world. So where does Becoming a Millionaire come into this? This man here is Scott Allen. He is one of the top authors at Pluralsight. This article, which was published earlier this year, talks about his rise to fortune via his course royalties. This specific article states that he has earned $1.8 million at the time of writing. Scott Allen is not the only one. Deanna Jump, a 43-year-old kindergarten teacher, achieved the monumental goal of earning over $1 million from her lesson plans. Deanna is proof that you don't have to be a tech giant or have a PhD to make it happen. All you need is the drive to share knowledge. Online training isn't becoming a huge business. It already is a huge business. First, you need an idea. If you're watching this, I'm sure you already have one. Once you have the idea, you're going to need to storyboard it. You'll need to write your scripts, record audio and video, edit and then release. I'll note that there are some that prefer not to do scripting, and we'll talk about this in a later slide, and that some prefer to record audio and video together. I prefer to record them independently of each other and then sync them up during editing. I'm not going to tell you one is better than the other, you'll just have to try both. However, in this video, I'm assuming that you're going to be doing both separate of each other. Consider your goal. While you may have an idea of what you want to share, you need to set a specific goal. What is the end result? The thing that you want the viewers to take away? This is important because what you decide will shape the material and its delivery. Consider your audience. Who is it that you're targeting? You have to target a specific viewer profile. This sets the tone, pace, and depth of the material you plan to deliver. For example, if you're planning to teach a viewer how to do basic algebra, you will most likely want to target someone who has a basic understanding of math and not students majoring in mathematics. Using this profile, you can shape your material and content to meet their needs and evaluate if the material is too rudimentary or too advanced for them. If you end up on either side of the line, you may lose the viewer. Consider your delivery medium. Are you planning to deliver the content to mobile devices, physical DVDs, or just YouTube? Defining this up front gives you a set of parameters and restrictions that you'll use to set up your environment. What I mean by this, for example, is resolution, audio format, length, and compression. From here, you can start a high-level outline, for example, an introduction. This is where you would go meta, which means to talk about the video itself. Maybe include something about you and why you decided to produce the video. Then a background. Maybe explain a bit about the problem you're solving or discussing. From there, a theory which would discuss a high-level abstract approach to a solution or the problem itself, followed by an example which would include a concrete real-world demonstration. Then a wrap-up with a conclusion and an outro. An outro is where you would put your contact details, a thank you, or whatever you like. Now this is just an example outline. Your outline will vary depending on your goals and the content that you're producing. Scripting is one of those things that some people like and some people don't. It's up to you. I personally prefer to script everything out beforehand. Unfortunately, not everyone has the ability to think on the fly. Others, like myself, have a hard time talking and typing at the same time. Trying to think on the fly has some negative side effects. The first is bad content. When you're trying to think about what to say next, you end up using vocal pauses such as um and ahs. It's okay when it happens every now and then during a live session, but a pre-recorded video should never have them. Overuse in live talks gives the audience an impression the presenter is unprepared or not familiar with the material. In recorded content, it gives the viewer the impression of sloppiness and lack of confidence. Forgetting points, rambling, and going off on tangents are also side effects. Of course, you can always edit these out later, but that increases editing time. Editing already consumes most of the time producing content, so why make it longer? I recommend scripting your actions. For example, if you're showing the viewer how to execute a complex command, write out each step. When it's time to actually record, you can follow your step-by-step -step instructions. This helps prevent pauses, typos, and doing the wrong thing or doing the steps in the wrong order. 
the importance of scripting actions increases as the complexity of the process increases. Scripting what you're going to say has many advantages. You have something to go by when recording, so you don't have the problem we already discussed with thinking on the fly. Not only that, you get to reread it over and over again and change it so that it's perfect and you'll never forget what you wanted to say, how you wanted to say it, or in the order in which it needs to be said. As a positive side effect of scripting, you have material that you can provide to your viewers if they ask for it, such as a transcript. If your content has animations, you can script those out as you would your actions. The only difference is these are usually automated. For example, if you have a set of images you need to cycle through in a slide deck, each coming at a specific point in your speech, you'll have a guide on when those actions need to occur. In my opinion, audio is the most important aspect of the whole process, even more than the content itself. If you went to see a blockbuster movie, but the audio was too loud, too low, or distorted in some way, you would notice and it would affect your experience. It's the same thing with screencasts. No one wants to hear static, pops, or other defects. So setting up your physical environment is critical. While I'm not an audio engineer, or even an audio file, I've learned a few things that really help when recording. The first is your equipment. You absolutely cannot cheap out on a microphone. I'm just going to go ahead and say no headsets. Headsets are inconsistent and do not deliver quality results. If you ask Pluralsight authors which microphone they use, about half will say a Rode Podcaster, and the other half will say a Blue Yeti. There are plenty of other great options. You just need to look for them. Expect to pay at a minimum $100. I use the Blue Yeti, which can be had from Amazon, for around $130. The Rode Podcaster is about $230. If you have a music store close to you, I recommend going in there and talking to someone and testing out different microphones. Once you have a good microphone, you need to give it a good place to record. No matter how good a mic is, if you have traffic, kids, or dogs barking in the background, you're going to hear it in your recording. Find a quiet room that limits exposure to background noises. Sometimes you'll have to record early in the morning or late at night when these things are not an issue. One of your biggest enemies is going to be your computer or laptop. They require fans to keep them cool and fans make a lot of noise that the mic will pick up. In addition to that, air conditioning and heating vents or anything else that moves air. Recording in a closet full of clothes is a good way to reduce noise. Putting a blanket over your head is another. These might sound funny, but they do work. However, they aren't always practical. Another option is to use sound dampening material. As you see in this image, there is what looks like a moving blanket lining the walls, and on top of that is a set of foam squares with ridges and valleys. This prevents the sound from bouncing back at the microphone, which is a big problem with fan noise, and will prevent echo or reverb from your vocals. One thing I want you to notice is this circle device. This is a pop filter, which prevents a popping noise in the audio, which occurs when you pronounce letters such as P. This is a nice to have, but not always necessary. I don't use one. I point this out because headsets are notorious for pops. If popping becomes an issue, get a pop filter or try putting a sock over the microphone. If you don't want to get so extreme, you can use egg crate foam. You can grab a big roll of it from the bedding section of Walmart for about under 10 bucks. Cut it up in the squares and line hard surfaces or walls. My workstation fan faces the wall, so I added a bit of foam on the wall where the fan blows out. This almost eliminated all noise in my audio. Since I use a Blue Yeti microphone, which is desk mounted, I set it on top of a piece of foam so that it reduces the sound bouncing off the desk surface back to the microphone. These two things have eliminated all noise in my audio. Use the foam to divert noise away from you and the microphone or to block it altogether. Some of you may choose to use a boom, which is a great option when you're going to be typing. Pressing keys on the keyboard will get picked up by any mic sitting on the desk, and it sounds like thunder in the recorded audio. With a boom, this doesn't happen. However, a boom is an additional cost. As an alternative, you can either add padding under the keyboard and mic, or record audio separate from the video. Adjusting your levels is very important and will help you fine-tune what your mic picks up and how it picks it up. You have two places to do this. On your microphone, assuming you have a high quality microphone, just check your microphone's documentation on how and what to change. And in software. I can't tell you exactly what settings to use because everyone's setup will vary. Your goal is to sit at a comfortable and consistent distance from the microphone and speak in a clear, confident voice. Audio playback should sound exactly the same. Everything should sound natural. You shouldn't have to yell, but you also don't want to speak too softly. 
adjust the levels and record a few lines of vocals and then play them back. If your voice is too loud, turn the levels down. If they're too low, turn the levels up. It's a process. Remember, you want everything to sound natural as if you were talking to someone in real life. Next, you need to get audio recording software. Most authors I know use Audacity because it's free and does its job well. Another option is Audition from Adobe. This is not a free product though. There are other options I'm sure, but Audacity is perfect for my needs and will most likely be for yours as well. You'll be using the software to record and do audio cleanup like noise reduction or removing clicks, ums, and mistakes. Once your setup is complete, you'll need to practice. I've been recording for over two years now, and it's still funny to talk when no one is around, and it's even funnier to hear my voice during playback. Just practice and get comfortable with the process and find your rhythm. When you're confident, start recording. You might want to create a checklist of things to do before you record. For example, turn off all cell phones, instant messaging, and anything else that might make a noise you don't want in your recording. Three tips I have for recording audio are to talk with your hands, just like you would as if you were talking to someone in person. This gives a more natural sound to your speech, especially if you're reading from a script. If you make a mistake like stumbling over a word or choking, clap your hands and then try the sentence or word again. When you clap, the audio will have a spike which is visible from the recording software. You can quickly see where the mistakes are and then edit them out. It saves a lot of time. Record all at once if possible. If you record right after lunch and again at midnight, the two tracks aren't going to sound the same. Your voice will sound normal after lunch, but tired at midnight. It makes for inconsistent audio. If you can't record all at once, try to record around the same time each day. You might try vocal exercises. They really do help in getting consistency in your voice. Once the audio is ready, you need video. There are plenty of options available, some free and some commercial. I personally use Camtasia from TechSmith, which is about $300. In my opinion, it's worth it. Cam Studio is an open source option, which I've had others tell me is a good option, but buggy. Find a few that you think are worthy and play with them. Test them out and see what they can do. I recommend getting a 30-day trial of Camtasia and get familiar with its features. If you don't want to purchase it, find an alternative that is most comparable to Camtasia. When you have your software, you'll need to adjust your screen resolution. Remember, you may have limitations depending on where you're publishing. For example, YouTube has a maximum resolution of 1280 by 720. Make sure everything you plan to show fits on the screen without looking funny. Adjust if necessary. Go ahead and record your video. Once you've recorded video and you've edited it all together, you need to enhance it by using visual aids. When you need to point out something important or specific, use callouts. For example, a big green arrow or dim the screen except for the area you want to focus on. Some people like to just circle the mouse around, but I don't really like this. You have the tools, do it right. Give your viewers a good experience. If necessary, zoom the screen in. This can be done while recording with a zoom tool or during editing using your editing software. However, you should limit the need to zoom by using proper screen resolution, font size, and don't clutter the screen. Okay, so you've recorded, edited, and it's awesome. What now? There are plenty of options out there. If you wish to monetize your video, you can publish to your YouTube channel, or if you're a developer looking to produce development related material, you can publish to bitcast.io. Pluralsight, Lynda, and Learnable are other options, but they don't take random video submissions. You need to contact them and discuss your ideas with them, and they'll tell you if it's a good fit or not. If they do want to take you on, they'll have specific guidelines you'll have to follow such as format, watermarks, slide deck backgrounds, fonts, and so forth. So that's the end of this video. Hopefully you found it useful, and I would like to see the videos you produce as a result, and to hear about your experience producing them. Feel free to contact me if you need any additional help or tips. Thanks for watching.